God wants to hear you sing whether you in your whether you think you can sing or not. God needs to hear your praise too. Whether it be through song, maybe it's through humming. Maybe it's through whistling. Maybe, maybe it's just off key, and that's okay too. Maybe it's through shower water. <laughs> you always do your best singing in the shower. If you can, take your big books. Turn to page number 310. Page number 310. Jesus is all the world to me. Page 310. While we take our morning tithes and offerings. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy. honestly believe in giving flowers when you can give them today. And um, Brother Adam and Sister Jess, they've recently married, but they had started with one child and then, and then uh, through circumstance, he now has four. But I'll tell you what, his spirit shines through. Through all of that and life's difficulty, I thank, I just appreciate both of them. Let's pray for him as he comes.
remember how you told me that life may not be easy and everything that I need you've already given me I remember how you told me I could trust you completely So why am I doubting When you proved that you'd fight for me You walked me through fire smoke billows higher oh and higher and it feels like I can barely breathe I walk through these fires cause you're walking with me I'm changed by your mercy I'm covered by your Drowning out the victory doesn't mean I won't feel the heat. You walk me through fire. of my redemption Lord how could I question when you prove that you die for me you walk me through fire pull me from flames if you're in this with me won't be afraid when the smoke billows higher oh and higher and it feels like I can barely breathe I walk through these fires cause you're walking with me I walk through We have a quartet that's going to come for us. Let's pray for them as they come. Well, I got up this morning and I started my day 
God's mercy was with me all of the way. His goodness stayed close by to meet all my needs. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm never forsaken, I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond measure, just look close, you'll see. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm counting my blessings as I journey along. Good friends, a family, and a place to call home. The church where I worship, the Bible I read. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm never forsaken, I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond measure, just look close, you'll see. My Lord is taking good care of me. When Satan comes tempting and he brings up my past, I tell him I'm forgiven and it's buried at last. The bloodshed at Calvary now speaks for me. I'm never forsaken, I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond measure, just look close, you'll see. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm never forsaken, I'm never alone. One day I'm moving to my brand new home. I'm blessed beyond measure. Just look close, you'll see. My Lord is taking good care of me. I'm blessed beyond measure. Just look close, you'll see. My Lord is taking He's always taking, my Lord is taking good care of me. Amen. Let's pray for Brother Sherm as he comes. Sing for us. God's grace makes things work. Down through the years of every one of our life, His grace has been given. Strength that we don't deserve. Blessings that we can't count. Thank God for all his goodness this morning. I was trying to think of the words to this old song, and I couldn't find them. And I wanted to sing it. But during the night, a couple nights in a row, I think, they went over and over and over in my mind. But for the mercy of God, where in the world would I be? I appreciate him this morning. I think I love him more than I ever have. And for sure, I don't want to let him down. Listen to the words. But for the grace of God.
the tramp on the street, homeless and weak, could be me, but for the grace of God, the steel of my soul may have weakened. Had I traveled the road he has trod, oh merciful Father, oh merciful God, Thy hands have spared me. Could be mine, but for the grace of God. And the, th I'm sorry. Yes, I'm going to start that verse over. The flower-strewn grave of a soldier. Could be mine, but for the grace of God and the blood that was shed by my Lord crucified, it was mine only for the grace of God. Oh, merciful Father, oh, merciful God, thy hand have spared me these things. May my heart have compassion like a child. to boast of my strength, but to lend it to the weak and downtrodden. May I always remember things dear to my heart are mine to only by the grace of
Okay. Thank God for the good singing. Kind of prepares our heart for the Word of God. And thank God for meaningful songs that have a a little weight and a lot of spirituality to them. Thank God for them. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Stay with me as I preach. Some things may raise questions in your mind, but I want you to see things from God's perspective and not from man's perspective from heaven's view and not from earth's view. All right, Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgajites and the Amorites and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, and they will, and they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, and break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, and above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of a house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Hold on here. From the book of Exodus to the book of Joshua, we see the birth of Moses his rise to power and authority in Egypt, his call to God to deliver God's people from Egyptian bondage. And then we see the crossing of the Red Sea and God's intent to cross over Jordan and bring them into the promised land of milk and honey. But they rebelled and rose up against God. They rose up against God's authority and were sentenced to 40 years in the wilderness in which hundreds of thousands died in that wilderness and never had entered into the land flowing with milk and honey. God challenged that first generation that came out of Egypt to be his special people. He was looking for a people that would be holy. Here they were, 430 years in Egyptian bondage, God miraculously delivered them, brought them out, and he was looking for a generation of people who would be holy and who would obey him and who would serve him, and he promised them blessings if they obeyed and curses 
if they disobeyed. And because they didn't obey God, you all know the story, they died in the wilderness. <clears throat> and the point is this. It is up to each new generation to decide whether or not they are going to live for God or live for themselves. We've got generations now alive right now in this country, three or four or five, but it's up to each generation. And more importantly, it boils down, it's up to every individual to decide whether or not you're going to serve God or you're going to serve Baal. Whether you're going to live for God or live for the world. Whether you're going to live holy or live unholy. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. And that's why when we stand before God, we won't be standing with our parents or our grandparents. We will all be standing alone and have to give an individual account of how we lived in this world. So it's up to you. It's up to every generation. You can live like you want to live. You can do whatever you want to do. You can use freedom as an excuse to live like animals. But you're going to stand before God. Every human being that ever lived is going to stand for God and give an account of the deeds that were done in his body. What are you doing with your body, generations? What are you trying to change in your bodies? God made us male and female, period. End of the subject. You're either a male or a female. Leave your body alone. We're all going to answer to God. And it's time for the pulpits in America to wake up and start cutting the word of God straight. And letting men and women know, boys and girls, teenagers, let them know that there is a God that we all have to reckon with at the end of the line. And just like the children of Israel, we face in the land of America, good or evil, blessing or curses. And just like Israel, our Canaanite neighbors today will try to pull us down. Also, they face the world, the flesh, and the devil. And now, today, in New Testament, we face the world, the flesh, and the devil. Question, which kind of a generation are we going to be? What kind of a man, what kind of a woman, what kind of a boy, what kind of a girl are you going to be? You're going to be good or you're going to be evil? You're going to be right or are you going to be wrong? It used to be when we heard about very evil people who raped and killed several women and serial killers or those who abuse and murder children, <clears throat> a lot of states enforced the death penalty. I was talking to a man today, not today, this week, and we were talking about all the children that are being massacred in our schools and in our streets and by drugs. 100,000 young people and young adults, families are being destroyed, children are dying, drugs by the millions and billions of dollars are coming into America like sewer lines. And people are dying everywhere. And one administration is aiding and abetting it. And the other generation is trying to stop it. Which side are you going to be on? You and I have to make up our minds, and I'm going to tell you why. Because Jesus is at the door. He's going to return. 
sooner or later, but he's going to return. And when he does, instantly, it's going to be over. And every man and woman, every politician, every preacher, every priest, every pope has to stand before God and give an account. <clears throat> A lot of states enforce the death penalty. But today, more than half of our United States no longer enforce the death penalty. Or if a criminal is convinced of an evil crime, <clears throat> it may take the state many years before the death penalty is enforced or the criminal will die in prison. And that is called, you know, habeas corpus, a long drawn out appeal process. And I'm not going to preach on the death penalty, but I want to make a point. The death penalty is a very controversial issue. Some feel it's morally wrong because they think it's racially biased. Others feel keeping prisoners on death row for years has adverse effect upon their mental condition. Very few countries in the world have legalized the death penalty. Governor Gavin Newsom announced a moratorium on executions in California affecting 737 inmates on death row. A moratorium is, you know, a legal authorization to prohibit an ex uh, ex uh, <clears throat> execution. One prison official answering objections to death by hanging said this, he will be rendered unconscious in one second. He will be dead in 17 seconds. And when he meets his God, he will have a lot to answer for. I started to tell you that conversation I had with that individual. He looked at me and I said, look at all these. Our nations, our cities, men are killing men. People are killing right and left in our streets. Babies, innocent babies are being killed. Thousands and thousands of people and babies are, that are being aborted. Murder all over the place. <clears throat> and this gentleman said to me, if I were the president, I'd bring back public hanging. It's just an opinion, folks. Don't look at me funny. Because you got an opinion and I got an opinion. And thank God we've got the freedom to voice our opinion. Here's what God's word says in many scriptures. The whole Bible. Evil has its payday, and the one in charge of the universe is moral and just. We need to know that God loves the right and does what's right and opposes evil. God's word says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. He says, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. If you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed by one another. He that committeth sin <clears throat> shall not prosper. Here's what is challenging to our faith. Here's where a lot of Christians struggle. The Bible often tells us things about God that make him appear unjust, unfair, and sometimes just plain wrong to our way of thinking today. We read to you verse 2 of our text. I want to show you how God dealt with evil in the Old Testament. You may think he was wrong, but I assure you, God knows what he's doing. And hopefully I'll be able to prove that to you. But verse 2 says, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver thee, deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy on them. 
There were some generations that God utterly eradicated because behind that eradication was the mercy and the love of God. He was trying to keep a malignancy from spreading from country to country, from nation to nation, from city to city, from home to home. He was trying to stop the bloodshed. Behind what we see in the Old Testament, if we don't understand the Bible, we're going to come away with the wrong impressions. Look at Exodus 23, 23. I just want to read a couple of things to sort of familiarize you with what's going on in the Old Testament. Exodus 23, 23. For my angel shall go before thee and bring thee into, unto the Amorites and the Hittites. This is when they cross over and go into the promised land. And the angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and I will cut them off. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. You know why a lot of people are sick today? Millions and millions of people are sick. It's partly because of the stress and the fear and the worry that people are dealing with because of all the wickedness that's around us. We wouldn't be as sick a nation today if we obeyed God you would have a whole lot less trouble physically in your life. But mark my words, according to the authority of God's word, God knows what he's doing. And I'm going to prove it to you. Look at Joshua 11. Just let me give you a couple verses just so you can get a feel for things. Joshua 11. All right, Joshua 11. And let's look at verse 12. Let's read it, just a few verses. And all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take, talking about the kings that are in the Canaanite, the promised land. And smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them. You don't raise up against God, God will show mercy on you. But if you continue your wickedness and your evil ways, there will be consequences. Consequences more difficult and more heavy than anybody wants to deal with. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left them, left they any to breathe. As the Lord commanded Moses' his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, so did Joshua. He left nothing undone, all that the Lord commanded. In Deuteronomy, you don't need to turn there, 12, verse 31, it says, they even burned their children in the fires of their gods. Parents whose hearts become so hard and so wicked and so calloused and so bound by the devil threw their children by the thousands into the fire trying to get some appeasement from a God, a God who was not even there, a God that couldn't deliver them. <clears throat> and 
God said? Those kind of people? Exterminate. I know. I know what you're thinking. But you're not thinking what God's thinking. And that's what I'm trying to, con- trying to convey. The bottom line is this. When reading the Bible, we find things which make our faith and we find things which challenge our faith, shake our faith. When Israel crossed Jordan and entered into the Canaan land, they became, for the first time, a nation of the world. When they entered into the Canaan land, they became another nation of many nations that existed in the world. And God had a whole bunch of admonition and rules and laws to give them to keep them from getting into trouble. Stay with me. They became a nation of the world, and ever since that day, God's people faced the problem how to relate to other nations around them. How were they going to have contact without contamination? How were they going to pull people up without those people pulling them down? How were they going to civilize them without becoming uncivilized by them? Without becoming disfigured? disheveled, disorderly, disarrayed. The point is this. The world doesn't set our trends and our patterns. The world is not the one that tells us how to dress, how to act, how to talk, and what to do. If you live and listen and love the world, you're going to be destroyed. Not physically, but your soul is going to be destroyed. And you're going to lose out and you're going to miss the promised land. You're going to miss heaven. The rock and the rap of today is filled with profanity and vulgarity. Most of the world's music is raunchy and vulgar. Most of their trends, their dress, their appearance are immodest. Their mouths are filled with blasphemy and cursings. Now, I'm not naive to the disturbing fact that nearly anything in our secular world can be justified in the name of freedom. Same-sex marriages justified under the deceptive idea of freedom. God does not allow And he destroyed a whole generation, a whole civilization who got perverted. God is nobody to play with. Under the the idea of freedom, since Roe versus Wade 63, 64 million babies have been murdered. Under the idea of freedom, babies are now being aborted after they're born. And now, with all the gender scramble, Our young children are being surgically changed 
their reproductive parts when they're not even old enough to understand the evil that's really behind adult incentives. All I'm saying, folks, and you need to start getting your head in the Bible, and you need to start understanding what, how God feels about some things. And he said it's better for you to tie a, mill t- a millstone around your neck and jump in the middle of the sea than to offend one of my little ones. And we got mothers, mothers, screaming and running, and priests and preachers running in our streets, holding up signs. It's our right. It's my body. I can do whatever I want. It's not your body. God made it. Wake up. What's happening? We're turning into savages. We're becoming an uncivilized society. We don't even look normal anymore. People's appearances are disfigured. It's time to wake up. And I'll tell you something. It's time for the preachers to wake up in America. And it's time for the politicians, 90% of them, to get saved. And every time they run for election... One of them drags out a big old Bible and wants everybody to know, I'm a Bible, I'm a this, I'm a that. No, you're a loser. Because politics and the filthiness of politics are more important than the souls. If you loved young people, you'd close the borders and stop the slaughter. If you love life, you'd, you'd, you'd stop Make abortion illegal and stop the slaughter. And you know what happened in the Diluvian world? The flood. The flood came. You know why? It repented God that he even created man. And it came up before him as a stench in his nostril. And he said, every imagination of the heart was evil continually. The generation had passed the point of no return. And then, in the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, they passed the point of no return. And that civilization... Civilization was so corrupt, God utterly destroyed them. I know, you still have questions and that's good. Give me a chance to answer them. Our ranchy ranchy entertainments, movies, porn sites, And medias that run into American homes like sewers is destroying the moral fiber and the nuclear family in America. And let me say this. All this music is called art. And every musician has a right to write and compose whatever he or she wishes. But having said that, I also believe that the art of a particular time is the best indication and reflection of the people of those times. The best reflection of the collective inner state of humanity at that time. Today's mainstream music by the likes of Keisha Rihanna, Nicki Minaj, Lady Gaga, just to mention a few of many, plus the hundreds and hundreds of rappers whose songs are filled with pornographic images and filthy listening. And what is disturbing? There are many excellent and decent songs to choose from. But what songs 
are the most popular? Those are the songs that the people out there have the appetite for today. Our youth, our teenagers, they don't have an appetite for decent songs anymore. And they're influenced. They want to be a part of something. They want to put their cool on. And most parents today are asleep. And many times the parents are listening to the same things. The most popular today for our younger generations and young youth and even beyond are the raw vulgarity songs and they influence our youth. Where are their mothers? Where are their fathers? Where are their pastors? Where are their bishops? Where are their priests? Songs like s and Rude Boy from the album Talk That Talk, and then the album Erotica are filthy to the max. It's sickening to see such creative, challenged writers using such foul and filthy lyrics to give their weak songs the added punch they need to sell. Sex sells. Everybody knows that. Whether it's toothpaste, whether it's automobiles, sex is in there because it sells. Sex sells. But let me remind you, that sin destroys both body, mind, and soul in hell. The videos out there are even filthier yet. And all this filth is normalized with an eighth grader singing, sticks and stones may break my bones, but whips and chains excite me. And millions and millions and millions of our children and young adults are having their innocence violated and their hearts and their lives destroyed. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? It has to start somewhere. And it has to start in America's home. And it has to start in America's churches. Something is not right with how things are going today. That is quite obvious. And this I know based on the authority of the word of God. This kind of evil is going to be visited just like it was in Noah's day. And just like it was in Abraham's day. What we're seeing and what we're entering in into this country is so despicable, so wicked, so evil, so heinous that something is going to give. Just as it did in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of things to come. It took all kinds of thousands of sacrifices of animals to to appease God and, and to make the people clear before God. But now in this day and age, it took just one sacrifice. The Lamb of God took away the sin of the whole world. And now Jesus Christ is our Savior. And he's the one who's going to make the difference. And parents who see signs of the kind of behavior need to sit their children down immediately and read Deuteronomy 6.6 to their children. When you lay down, talk to the children. 
When you get up in the morning, talk to the children. Tell them about God and his laws. And when you go out, then hang the, hang the thing between your eyes and talk to them about God. We're talking about get into their head, get into their brain and tell them there are consequences for people who don't obey God. There's a sister in this church whose granddaughter came home from one elementary school and another one came home from Newark High School and they had books, books that were vulgar in Newark. Do you know, Mom, Dad, Grandma, do you know what your kids are being taught in the elementary school system in Newark, Ohio? In the high schools? It's exactly right. And they put it under another name. And the whole time, your children are being stolen right under your nose. I know these things are hard to preach on a Sunday morning. I know that. God's answer, all this ungodliness of ancient Israel was easy. It was eradication. But in the gospel day, it will come to an end. And that end will come quickly. When Jesus Christ splits the clouds, he's not going to do anything on this earth because there's going to be no earth here. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat. The earth is going to burn. And in a moment's time, in a blink of an eye, all that are in their graves are going to come forth. Those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those that have done evil. And we're going to be caught up in the air. <clears throat> you talk about a ride. You're going to have the ride of your life. Ain't no carnival. Ain't no... Uh, Roller coaster that's going to even come close. And we're going to rise to either one place or the other. I told the people, we're in the seventh seal age of the gospel. We're in what's called the Laodicean. It's a lukewarm condition. It's an apathetic condition. Every man, woman, child was put to death. And for some, this, possess, this poses no problem. And yet for others, it does. God is God, and he can do whatever he wants to do. Others can disagree. It's up to them. One commentator offered Psalms 136. To people, I mentioned this Wednesday, but I had the wrong verse, the wrong chapter. <clears throat> Who questioned God, he said, the slaughter of the Canaanites illustrated the everlasting mercy of Jehovah. Let us remember this and fling to the wind all our silly reasonings and ignorant arguments. All 26 verses of Psalm 36, from the creation to the end talks about how God's mercy endureth forever. And keep in mind that God was the one who commanded that evil nations be destroyed. Some want to believe that Moses and Israel only thought that, but that's not so. God destroyed the Antediluvians, the flood, and God destroyed those in Sodom and Gomorrah. The commands to exterminate evil were given by God and they're all over the word of God. People use their reason and sense of fairness to attack the validity of the Bible. One lady told a theologian she did not believe in hell. She said there was no way a merciful God would let anyone stay in hell forever. The theologian said, do you believe in heaven? And the woman said, of course I do. Then he said, madam, 
You have no more right to believe in heaven than to believe in hell. For the Bible teaches both. If I throw one out, I'd have to throw the Bible out also. Because it also teaches there's an eternal place called heaven. I'm sure some of these harsh things in the Bible upset us. It's not a sin to have questions. You remember when God was going to destroy Sodom? He said, shall I tell my friend Adam, uh, Abraham? So God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, utterly destroy them. Abraham protested. He said, God, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can you call yourself a just God and destroy the good people with the bad people? Abraham said, if I can find 50, if I can find 40, 30, 15, if I can find five, will you spare the city? There weren't even five. There's nothing wrong with people protesting and trying to challenge God, but keep in mind while you're trying to reason with God, his thoughts are far above our thoughts as the heavens are from the earth. God knows what he's doing. And it's only the mercy of God that we're not living in the Old Testament way. Christ came. He's a merciful God. A long-suffering God, a patient God. He's waiting for people to come back to him. Jesus himself questioned his father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to be separated from you, not even for a moment. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine, O Father, be done. We don't understand a lot of things, church. The wrath of God fell upon those civilizations. That's why John 5, 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. It's coming, church, in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now listen, I know my time's gone. For the good of future generations, God used the nation of Israel as his servants to remove the cancer of the Canaanite nation's evil from off the earth. From God's perspective, the universal slaughter of all the Canaanite nations was a merciful act of protection from hurting other nations of the world. God said, when you go into the promised land, I want you to utterly destroy everything. And the reason God did that is so the rest of the world can live in peace and not with crazy people, with nuclear weapons and terrorists. But that element is not going to be released or removed now. Because we're living in a day of mercy. So you've got to make up your mind. You're going to get in bed with the Canaanites? Or are you going to save your own soul from this toward, untoward generation? Got to make up your mind. Every church, every person in the world got to make up their mind. What you going to do? Let me close. And you know what happened. Jake, Joshua, Moses, Caleb, 
They gave the people. Now we're getting ready to cross over. We're getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. And remember what God said. You have to destroy every single one of them. You know what happened. The people of God didn't destroy them. They let bad, evil things go on, just like we are in America. We let pornography go on. Same-sex marriage go on. We let everything rotten to the core go on in America. And it's destroying America. And it's destroying your children and your children and your children. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, people. Now, here's the point. I'll close with this. I left a lot out of this message. Maybe this illustration will help us understand. Our view from this side of heaven is very limited. We can't even begin to match what God thinks. True story. One of the natives became very sick. And a missionary doctor had to do immediate surgery. And so they prepped this native who was in excruciating pain, and his son came back from the hunt. And when he saw that surgeon raise the knife and start to cut the stomach of that native open, whom was father, he went crazy, wanted to attack him, wanted to kill him. And they had to tie the guy to a tree. And they tied the son to a tree, and he cut that man open, took something out of him, appendix, whatever it was that was infecting him, killing him, and all was quiet. And the son that was tied to the tree that wanted to kill that missionary, he started to see. He began to realize that what surgery did for his father was a good thing. And instead of wanting to kill the doctor, he couldn't love him enough. We are living in a land full of spiritual Canaanites. Canaanites of all kinds. And there is only one solution. Spiritual eradication. We must utterly destroy and remove from our lives anything that is working to destroy our relationship with God. And if you get close enough to God, church, he'll tell you exactly what it is that needs to be removed. He'll tell you pornography's wrong. Drugs are wrong. All this stuff that's going on in America that we thought we'd never see on our shores. And from the top down to the bottom, they're all calling for it. They're all in love with it. They're trying to destroy our country and they're trying to take over the world. And the Revelation talks about a gathering of the eighth beast. And I won't go over the chart and all that, but there are systems that are all coming together. They're coming out of the four corners of the earth. Revelation 20 says they're numbered as the sands of the seashore. And they're going up on the breadth of the earth, encompass the earth, to destroy, listen what they're after. 
to destroy the people of God. They're not after the White House. They're not after the terrorists. They're looking for the beloved city. They're looking for people who are living by the book, who are standing up for what the book says. They're looking for people who are advocating what is right, what is holy, what is righteous. And the first kind of people they're going to come after is me. And you who sit here and listen to me. They don't want spiritual churches in America. That's why they tried to close them all down during the COVID. They destroyed businesses. They destroyed cities. They destroyed wealth. Because they've got an agenda. And they're coming for your home. And they're coming for my home. I know this wasn't the type of message most people want to hear. But I'm sick and tired of hearing all that milk and honey stuff. I'm getting old enough. I want somebody to tell me the truth. And I know the truth, it hurts. But I'd rather be hurt a little bit on this side of eternity where there's mercy. All right, Case, well, you got, let's just sing it from there. What is it, do you know? What's a good, I'll tell you this song, Uh, there's a song I love, Heaven Holds All to Me. Because that's all we got, folks. If you want to know the truth, that's all we got to look forward to. Life in this world, if it keeps going, life in America, if it keeps going as it's going, there's no future for our grandkids, no future for our kids. But there is a bright future. I know God will protect us. I know God will take care of us. But heaven holds all. That's all we got to look forward to. So my question to you is, are you getting all caught up with going on out there in the world? Are you listening to their music and listening to their ideas? Are you all caught up in their appearances? Or can you see what's behind the appearances? And it's just the enemy trying to destroy our kids. Remember, we are created in the image of God. What you see walking around in our streets today and in our markets and in our uh, uh, malls, it doesn't look like the image of God. We're going back to the days of savagery. And we're seeing it in our streets. And it shouldn't be no surprise. Because every nation that forgets God is turned into hell. And mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, you see your children leaving the house and they don't look like an image of God, have a character of holiness, sit them down and have a talk to them. Talk to them from your heart. I know it's hard. I don't have parents. I don't have kids. I understand that. But I preach to a whole bunch of kids every Sunday. And I'm a spiritual father. But God help us. Prayer is the only thing going to turn it around. One man with God, sure, is a majority. We don't have to sit back and let them trample us. Stand up. Amen? I preach this way 
because I love America and I love God and I love you. And I have to absorb a lot of opinions and a lot of glares. That's all right. That's part of the package. But when I stand before God, you're not going to be there. And I got to give an account to God of how I lived. Not only in public, but how I lived in the dark. So I'm doing my best to get us to heaven. Case, come on. Let's sing. 486, would you like to stand and give it some thought, whisper something to God in prayer if you have any needs. <clears throat> We're not going to ask anybody to come forward, it's too late. But you can ask God to help you right where you are, and I know God will do it. You've been a great audience, you've been very attentive. I'm sorry for the cough, I don't know where it come from, it just started when I got in the pulpit. Listen to these.